and we are back episode number seven of the plume cast thank you guys all for stopping by once again and if you've been watching my daily uploads throughout the week leading up to the plume cast on sunday i really appreciate all the engagement and for watching those as well if you're new here, this is your first time tuning into the channel. This is my weekly podcast, my weekly solo podcast, where I talk about gaming news, stuff that I just missed throughout the week and didn't upload a video for, or maybe just double down on some other stuff that I did talk about if I wanted to get more into depth. Because there's tons of news going on, so it's almost impossible to cover it all with a daily upload video. But if you haven't checked out my videos, go to the channel. Like I said, daily news videos, Monday through Saturday, generally, unless there's really nothing to talk about. And then we got plume casts on the Sunday. But thank you guys all for stopping by. If you're new here, you like what you see on my channel, you like what you hear throughout the podcast, consider subscribing. It really does mean a lot to me. Now, every week on the podcast, I drink a beer and I ask you guys for your suggestions of beers I should check out. In living in Canada, we don't get all beers from around the world. We get sometimes, this depends where you go. Like some stores have stuff, some stores don't. But today I have this beer here from North Bay, Ontario called Tree Topper. It is a red ale and I do like red ales. They're one of my go-to beers if I just want to kind of try something different, try something with some flavor. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a decent beer. It's my first time having it. It's a good solid red ale. They're called the New Ontario Brewing Company from North Bay. So cheers to everyone out there. If you're having a drink, having a beer, let me know what you guys are drinking in the comments below. Now, what I've been playing this week has been, I'd say, a new release week plus finishing off some, some older stuff that I haven't finished off yet. So I finished, firstly, Resident Evil 8. And wow, that was just an awesome game. It took me about... Nine and a half, ten hours to beat, I would say. You can probably beat the entire story in like seven to eight hours if you were to rush from beginning to end. If you do a little bit of exploration, probably around nine to ten. And then if you try to complete the game, if you're going to complete everything on the map, probably around ten to twelve hours. So I beat the campaign. I did a decent amount of exploring. And it took me about ten hours, nine and a half, ten hours to complete and I absolutely loved it. it. Right now, I would say Resident Evil 8 Village is sitting in that category for me as a game of the year contender in 2021. It is it is that good. If you like the Resident Evil series, it really adds just another great entry into this series. The graphics are amazing. The best looking game I've seen right now on an Xbox Series X in terms of just the details and the environments and the enemies and the facial animations. It really is that good. So that was, I wouldn't say a nice surprise because I had a good feeling that it was going to be a great game and it lived up to it. I love how they just kind of added on to Resident Evil 7 with the story. You learn about Ethan Winters. You kind of, you see what happens to him. You see what happens to his wife and everything. And I don't want to get into any spoilers because it's a brand new game, but it is a change from Resident Evil 7 in the sense that it isn't scary. I didn't find Resident Evil 8 Village scary at all. There was like maybe one or two scenes in the game or one or two areas with some dolls and stuff that was a bit creepy. But the game wasn't scary compared to Resident Evil 7. And that comparison a lot of people are making to Resident Evil 4 is a great comparison. It's more action based. You never really feel like you're running out of items or you're running out of ammo or bullets because it's really easy to get stuff to craft bullets and to get money to buy bullets from the from Duke, who is the dealer in the game. So you never really feel like you're stranded with nothing to do or nothing to protect yourself with. So there isn't that really that survival element, but it is a great game and if you are on the fence of checking it out, if you liked Resident Evil 7, I would say definitely check it out if you want to continue the story. But don't expect it to be the exact same as 7 as it isn't as scary. It isn't as survival-y as Resident Evil 7, but still such a great game. And I loved Resident Evil 7. One of the things with 7 was I was scared shitless throughout that entire game. It was a terrifying game. And maybe it's because I played it in VR on the PlayStation VR, but even if you aren't in VR, it was still a terrifying game. And you don't have that same sort of fear with an eight, at least for me. I mean, maybe some people will, 
maybe they maybe there's certain areas that are more scary to some people than to others than to me but it, it's a great game right now in that game of the year contender circle or realm or whatever you want to call it right now and we're in may so there's still a lot of time for lots of contenders to get out there to get into that discussion now other than that i finished off destroy all humans just a hilarious game that was fun the final boss is actually pretty hard even if you have your guy fully upgraded you gotta like make sure you're continuously transfiguring your ammo to so you don't run out and you have i forget what it's called like the fire gun or whatever i don't remember the name of it but make sure you have that gun on you and have lots of ammo in order to destroy the the final boss but it's just a fun quirky game with good humor they did a great job on the remake I guess I think it's a remake or a remaster. It just graphically looks like a remake because it looks really good. And yeah, just a fun time. I said this in last week's podcast as I was playing through it. It's one of those games where you just kind of sit back and you you just, you don't need to pay too much attention to the story. You just hear the stupid lines that they say and you laugh because it is funny. And the references, a lot of the stuff that they say is is interesting. If you think about when, when they said it, when that game came out and in the world we're in today, it has a it has a pretty good funny tone to it, but that was the Royal Humans. And then on Friday, I picked up Mass Effect Legendary Edition. So I've been playing through Mass Effect One, and I was surprised at how what they did with the graphics. The game looks and runs great at a higher frame rate, and graphically, it's more than just a small shine to the graphics. It is definitely an upgrade from the original game. So if you like Mass Effect, I, there's not really too much to sell on that game. Like if you haven't played Mass Effect before and you're interested in space RPGs, Mass Effect Legendary Edition is 100% a game you should try out, game you should buy. If you like Mass Effect and you want to get back into it, it's definitely the best way to experience it again. And I mean, if that's it, like it's a game worth trying out if you like Mass Effect because the upgrades to the graphics, the upgrades to the frame rate do make a massive difference from when you originally played it back on the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3. And that alone to me is worth picking this game up and playing through the games again. So I'm going to get through one, two, and three at some point, but I'm going to go right from the beginning to end. And then you can actually transfer your character over from each game. So that's cool. Right through the Legendary Edition. And you can have that whole saga of that story with that one character you made right at the the beginning now that's what i've been playing this week let me know what you guys have been playing i'm sure there's tons of stuff tons of different games out there that people are playing especially with game pass but this week in the news again more lots of stuff to go over and uh pretty interesting stuff to talk about we got the xbox celebrating their 20 year anniversary a bunch of playstation news in terms of games coming out playstation on steam and just some numbers and sales and stuff like that. And then we got some more Xbox news with another interesting partnership to say the least and a bunch of other stuff. So let's jump right into it. First, talking about Xbox's 20 year celebration. So Xbox's 20th anniversary, it's coming up really fast, November 15th, 2021, when they first released the original Xbox with Halo Combat Evolved. That was such a big day in gaming because it was Microsoft's first foray into the console market. And then you had Halo, which was, in my opinion, a revolutionary industry changing first person shooter for the console market. And all of that on November 15th, 2001. So they're getting off to the celebration a bit earlier. They released this video here, just kind of giving us a flashback from the original Xbox up to what we have right now. It's a pretty cool video. I find a lot of these recent marketing videos that Xbox has been putting out have been just super on point, specifically the one with after the Bethesda roundtable when they finalized the Bethesda acquisition with Xbox that that video got me so hyped up I probably watched it like a hundred times it was really well done but then they put this one out here with hashtag Xbox 20 so if you're on social media you can write that hashtag Xbox 20 and you'll get like the little 20 logo with that hashtag and with this announcement they went ahead and they announced just some gear and some interesting stuff to keep your eye on leading up to November 15th, 2021. 
So they go over, they give us the history, they talk about the gaming. They say there's been 1 trillion total gamer score achieved, which is absolutely insane. 1 trillion, because that's just like a crazy number. They have this really awesome wallpaper that they release, which I have it as my computer wallpaper now, because this is one of the nicest pictures I've seen, just kind of commemorating Halo from Halo CE on the left side here with the upcoming Halo Infinite Master Chief. And it just, it looks awesome. I want to get this picture like on a big print and like put it on, on my wall because it's a beautiful picture. But right now it's on my desktop background. And there's a bunch of other actual desktop backgrounds that you can go and, and see. There's a link in this article here. And they talk about the 20 years at Xbox. And it also marks the 20th anniversary of the Halo franchise. So 20 years, 20th anniversary of... People are saying Halo Infinite's coming out on November 15, 2021, because that would just be like a perfect thing to wrap all of this up. And they do mention in this article that they are thrilled to celebrate this milestone as well as the launch of Halo Infinite with our players this fall. So I, this is this right here says Halo Infinite is coming out this fall. I know they said they've already said that. People are still speculating whether this game is going to get delayed. I've said it is not going to get delayed. I believe it is going to come out this fall from everything that we've been hearing, from everything they've been showing off with the Halo Waypoint updates and how they have said they are just really upgrading the graphics and the game has been done for quite a while and they're just putting the finishing, polishing touches on it and that this extra year of development has allowed them to do this. Because from what I understand, is Halo Infinite was ready to go. It would have been ready to go with the launch of the Xbox Series X and S, but obviously it wasn't polished. They would have released it in a state where, where throughout this entire year, they would have been updating it to make it look better and run better and all that kind of stuff. So they decided to delay it so that when they do release it, that's not something we're going to have to deal with. That's the way I understand it from everything that they have been saying. Now, this may or may not be what actually comes to fruition when the game is released but that's what i understand it and when they put this line in here at the bottom it's in my opinion pretty much confirming this game is not going to get delayed but it, who knows right covid all the all the stuff going on in the industry with people working at home and the stuff that jason Rawl talked about on the iron lords podcast where he said that it's a big difference with quality assurance when you're working at home whereas before COVID everyone was just in a big lab and they were able to just get in there and make sure that the game was running properly and, and look at people's computers and, and all that kind of stuff and they can't do that now with COVID so that still could pop up and it still may delay the game but I am pretty confident from seeing the Halo Waypoint from just listening to the reading the articles that have been coming out about it and listening to people talk about it that it's going to come out and I'm very, very hopeful because I do want to play Halo Infinite. I'm just dying to play it. But now after that, they showed off some gear coming out with the new 20th anniversary logo. And it's a cool logo. I like the the Halo one more so than the just regular 20 with the Xbox logo. I really like this Master Chief one. I was considering picking one of these shirts up, but for some reason, the store just wasn't working for me. I don't know if that's a Canadian thing or not, but I'll try again. I, I don't think that these are going to be something that you're not going to be able to get. But I haven't checked since last time I checked, so I may be eating my words after this podcast when I go and try to log in to get it. And yeah, that's like the big beginning first announcement of 20 years of Xbox. And this is the start. And I think we're going to see a lot more about this stuff leading up to E3 or at least at E3, and then after leading up to November of 2021. So it's an exciting year for Xbox, lots to celebrate, and I think they're doing a great job. And it would just be absolutely perfect if Halo Infinite launched on November 15th, 2021, commemorates 20 years of Xbox, commemorates 20 years of what probably my favorite game franchise of all time, and in my opinion, the best first-person shooter around all wrap it up into like a nice bow 20 years of xbox celebrate with the fans and i think it will be awesome so if you are interested in any of this stuff there's also like the fan fest stuff to participate in so there's xbox fan fest to participate in 20th anniversary activities including exclusive sweepstakes fan fest gear and digital experiences so all that stuff is on this xbox wire page if you are interested in that and i will 
put this link in the description below if you guys haven't seen it. But I just wanted to talk about that because I think, again, they reiterate here that Halo is coming out this fall and that it won't be delayed. And I, and then you have this awesome picture showing it off. Like this right here, just like, it's so perfect. This picture is so perfect for what could happen if this game is released 20 years after the first one came out. So in hindsight, it's like, it's almost good they delayed it. It just makes it even more exciting for the release of it. And moving on here from the Xbox 20th anniversary stuff, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a game that really holds a special place in my heart. And one of my favorite games, it's in my top, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say top 10 because there's so many games. But one of my favorite games I've ever played. Let's just leave it at that. And it is Sunset Overdrive. Now, Sunset Overdrive is a very special game for me because I got my Xbox One with the Sunset Overdrive bundle. I have the Sunset Overdrive Xbox One box up there on my shelf. And in my opinion, it is the nicest console box ever made that I can remember. It's so cool and unique i absolutely love it it was that white i think it was the first white xbox one or it was like the first special edition white xbox one that came bundled with the game but it was the white xbox one the big vcr one with a white controller and it came with sunset overdrive and the funny thing is i didn't buy that because i wanted to play sunset overdrive i bought it because i wanted to play halo master chief collection and this was the version that was available to me. And I said, what the heck, I'm going to pick it up. And then I'll tr eventually try Sunset Overdrive whenever that is. So I got it. I started playing Halo Master Chief Collection. As we know with Halo Master Chief Collection, when that game first came out, there were so many issues with it, with servers and everything. And it was just, it was in a bad state. So I, I put it down, waiting for it to get better. And I jumped into Sunset Overdrive. And I think that was probably one of the best things I could have done at that time because Sunset Overdrive became one of my favorite games that I've ever played. It's one of the most fun, unique games out there. It was, in my opinion, at that time, the most interesting and unique game on the PS4 or the Xbox One. And it was a game that nobody was talking about. And I was so annoyed about that. And the only thing I could think of was because it was on an Xbox One and the Xbox One was just in the shadows of the PlayStation 4 for the beginning of that generation. So I just think nobody talked about it. Nobody marketed it. Xbox was already planning their next moves, pretty much getting to where we are now with Game Pass and the Series X and X. So they were just like, okay, whatever. We'll just, we'll just push it under the carpet. That's the only thing I can think of. And it's unfortunate because then Insomnia got bought by PlayStation and that was pretty much the ax that we were going to see if we were going to see another Sunset Overdrive. But it's back in the news again, and the title of this article says, Nothing is stopping Insomniac from developing a new Sunset Overdrive. And as we know, Insomniac is an exclusive PlayStation developer. So that means if they were to develop another Sunset Overdrive, it would more likely than not, unless PlayStation has an epiphany, puts it on Xbox, it's going to be a PlayStation exclusive. Or maybe, you know what? This is a game that they may also put on PC. So there is that light at the end of the tunnel there if you don't have a PlayStation. But this is the article. It says, speaking with GQ, Insomniac's Marcus Smith revealed that there is nothing stopping the studio from developing a new entry in the series as the IP is owned by the studio. And here is the question. Is there any life left in Sunset Overdrive franchise? given it used to be an Xbox exclusive? And the answer is, I mean, never say never is my approach. Obviously we're part of Sony now, but we own the IP. And so there's nothing really stopping us other than we have a lot of really exciting things in the future. Then they go on to say here, the, the next question was, I suppose the question is, would you want to make another one? And the answer is, I would. I think there's a lot of stories that can be told in that universe and I would love to return to it. I had a lot of fun making that game. So there you have it. It's it's like it's obviously up in the air. They know they can make it whenever they want. It probably comes down to you if they get the green light and the go ahead from Sony. And with Insomniac working on Spider Man and Ratchet and Clank, you know Sony has those stats of how much those games cash in. Spider Man Two is going to probably be the next game that they work on. The chances of a Sunset Overdrive Two coming anytime soon is probably almost at zero percent maybe it's a one percent chance that's that's what i'm thinking but they may do some sort of 
remaster or remake or something of it if it's not something that will take as much resources as creating a brand new sunset overdrive and if they do do any of this keep in mind this these will games will probably be playstation exclusives but i can see them releasing this on pc potentially and that being said it's actually a perfect segue into this next topic and it's a topic that i think is something to keep your eye on for sure and it's a very interesting topic if you're somebody like me who is all for getting games on multiple platforms so that more people can experience them and it is that playstation steam page is live and it seemingly hints at more pc content so right now the storefront lists 41 pieces of content but only half of that content is actually visible so there's 24 pieces of content that you can see but they have 24 games and dlc that are associated with the sony division on this page so right now through steam on pc you're able to get horizon zero dawn predator hunting grounds and hell divers so they're only playstation pc titles and then we're going to get days gone some uh, it's later this month that's going to be available on pc as well that was their after horizon their next big first party game that they put on to the pc platform which was kind of a hint of sony was seeing that their old school mentality when it comes to exclusives locked into a console and you have to buy a playstation to play those games is slowly starting to go away because they are seeing the amount of money that they are missing out on and i've said this right from the beginning that we are going to see playstation games on pc at some point and i wouldn't be surprised if their biggest first party games are coming to pc whether that is months after they are released or that is through a subscription service where they're coming day and date at the same time through the PlayStation console. And I'm not the only person who thinks this, and PlayStation has kind of reiterated this point because in a report that was published last summer, I probably did a video on this, and it was Sony first said they would explore bringing more PlayStation exclusives to PC following Horizon Zero Dawn's release on the platform. And Horizon Zero Dawn's release on PC is actually quite comical because when i so right now i have i uh, just i hit 4000 subscribers last week i think i'm at like 4100 or so right now so again it's before i continue with the topic thank you guys all for the support it really means so much to me that you guys are like watching and subscribing and you're enjoying this content i it's why i do it so i can't thank you enough for that but when i was way way tinier than that maybe at like 200 subscribers or something i made a video talking about horizon coming over to pc and i got a lot of comments or just like i think i was predicting it or there was a rumor and i said this is going to happen like it's going to happen just it's inevitable i got some funny comments in those videos um that people were like it's not going to happen i'm going to keep this video so that i can come back to the video once it never happens and tell you you were wrong and all this kind of stuff and what obviously happened was Horizon came to PC and now we're seeing Days Gone and I think we're going to see that with more PlayStation games going into the future and they're even talking about it with they with their reports with their corporate reports that they want to do this and they're also even saying that if you guys remember Jim Ryan confirmed that PlayStation will bring a whole slate of games to PC starting with Days Gone, which is releasing this month, and then they're going to be bringing more stuff. And he also said that the opportunity to bring PlayStation's IPs to a wider audience as well as an easier port process meant that making more games for uh, for PC was now a fairly straightforward decision for the company. Now, you can believe what he says there, but what I think he's really saying there is that we are viewing what is happening in the video game industry. And it's all been kicked off with Xbox, how they opened up their ecosystem to allow their games day and date and on Xbox, on PC, through mobile. And even if before they were day and date, just allowing them throughout the ecosystem. And we are seeing how the user base is reacting to that, the subscribers to Game Pass going up, the actual user retention probably is higher, the actual usage time from each user is probably insane when you think about being able to play anywhere and there is so much revenue and so much money to be made through having a really awesome subscription service like game pass and just putting your games out on pc as well as putting them out on your console because we've seen games that are released day one on game pass not 
from Xbox Game Studios or from third par- third parties like uh, Square Enix and people can fly with Outriders where games come out day one on Game Pass. They have such huge user engagement through Game Pass and they are topping the charts on Steam for sales, which is crazy because what PlayStation is probably seeing here is that if we put our first party games on PlayStation 5 and we release them on PC, we're still going to sell millions and millions and millions and millions of PlayStation 5s. Like they're still going to be a top selling console. People are still going to pay full price for the games on PlayStation. And I can almost guarantee that PC gamers are also going to pay full price for a lot of these PlayStation games. And PlayStation games will probably be in the top charts on Steam as well when they first get released if they are to release those games on Steam. So they're seeing that. They know the money is there. I think that the user base, the PlayStation fan base, like the hardcore fanboys would be really hurt if this happens and they know that as well and they don't want to like piss off their fans and they got to do it slowly but surely. But I think at some point we are going to see PlayStation games releasing on PC at the same time as they release on PlayStation and may not be this generation and maybe next. And I know that's like such a long prediction to make, but I just do see that coming based off of way the, the way the industry is going and how successful Xbox has been with this and how successful Xbox Game Pass with their subscription has been. And there's 41 pieces that we don't see, or not 41, but there's half of the listings on their Steam Curator page that we don't see, and nobody knows what that is. So it will be very interesting to keep an eye out on potentially more PlayStation games coming over to Steam on PC. And I would love to see this happen. Like more than anything, I would love to see this happen just because I would, I mean, I don't touch my, my PS5. I really don't. It's, it's, um, it's a big clunky console. I beat Miles Morales with it and I haven't, it's been collecting dust ever since. That's just the truth. And that's not because I'm an Xbox fanboy or an Xbox fan. It's because there hasn't been anything that has piqued my interest. Now, the next game that's going to pique my interest is Ratchet and Clank. Again, though, with these PlayStation 5 games, it just, it hurts me. And you may call me hypocritical because I purchased Resident Evil 8 and I purchased um, Mass Effect Legendary Edition. But both those games were the regular price of video games in Canada since the ps4 and the xbox one they were the 80 dollars price tag and with resident evil 8 i already sold it back because i bought that as a physical version because i had credit at eb bought as a physical version sold it got 60 dollars back off of it so that, that there's like the plus for that but i mean these playstation 5 games they are 89.99 and I know it's only a ten dollar difference, but it's just like a it's like a mental. You know when there's a price of something, there's a certain price where mentally you're okay with, and then if it ever gets past that price, even if it's like a dollar or two, you just can't mentally get past that. You can't mentally break that barrier in your mind of do you want to spend that amount of money on that product? And I'm telling you, eighty nine ninety nine for me, I can't mentally break that barrier. I do not want to spend ninety dollars before taxes to buy one game which means I'm probably not even going to get Ratchet and Clank a launch. I'm probably going to wait until that game goes on sale. So I'm just sitting here thinking like, why do I even own a PlayStation 5? I should probably sell it. I should probably wait until they make a slimmer version and then I'll be able to pick up Ratchet and Clank and all of the other first-party PlayStation games that I want at a later date for half the price. I'm actually leaning along those lines. I may actually do that. But so... If it comes to PC, then I would, I would never even have to worry about that. And it's not because I want the PlayStation fanboys to cry that their games aren't exclusive to their, their diehard platform anymore. It's just because it would make my life easier. And I think it would make a lot of people's lives easier. So we'll have to wait and see if this happens. But I do foresee more PlayStation games coming to PC in the next few years now moving on to this next topic staying on playstation this was an article that was published this week and it is that sony has 25 ps5 games in the works including characters that you've never seen so that's a large amount of games that if you're on playstation to keep your eye on for announcements and stuff like that but what's interesting about this announcement is that they say here nearly half of them will not be sequels or spin-offs 
And I think a lot of these games are going to be coming from third-party studios that are going to publish games primarily or exclusively on PlayStation, whether that is through timed exclusivity or for ever exclusivity. But right now we look at the the lineup for 2021-2022 that hasn't been confirmed or really denied, I guess you could say, even though I think like God of War is not coming out this year. But we got Horizon Forbidden West, which there was some stuff that it has there ha, there was stuff that came out about this recently kind of pushing home the point that this game is actually going to come out in 2021. Maybe that's something that we will see at some sort of summer event that Sony has because they're not at E3 or maybe they'll just do just a huge announcement or a state of play or whatever. Then we got Ratchet and Clank to Rift Apart, which has gone gold. That's coming out in June. And then you got God of War Ragnarok, which I do not think is coming out in 2021. I just don't see how. Then you got Gran Turismo 7, which is coming out in 2022. Now these are four big first party games that are coming out relatively soon or not like it's hard to really say because they haven't given us any information it's particularly with god of war and gran turismo so there's those and then they got to fill in gaps i mean playstation has to fill in their gap because they have said that their focus with their studios and their first party studios is big blockbuster games which i would assume take five to six years to make each of these big blockbuster games and they have all of their studios working at one and they spread those out. There's going to be massive gaps where there's nothing new coming out for PlayStation. And the way that they're going to tackle this is by going out and hiring and signing third party publishers who are not owned by Sony and owned by PlayStation, but they're going to create a game and they're going to publish it exclusively on the PlayStation 5. And we've seen them already kind of starting to do this. So there's Kenna. The Bridge of Spirits, which is developed by an indie studio or a third-party studio. And this game is coming out firstly exclusive on PlayStation, but also on PC through the Epic Game Store, I believe. So it, it may come over to Xbox at some point or to other platforms. And then you have the newly formed Haven Studios, which was created by Jade Raymond, who is one of the creators of Assassin's Creed Ubisoft. And she left Google when they cl- when they shut down their in-house Stadia development studio, started Haven Studios, and she's working on an exclusive game for PlayStation. And I think this is what they're going to do. So when you see here 25 games in the works at PlayStation, it isn't going to be 25 first-party Sony st- uh, PlayStation Studio games. It's going to be spread out between a lot of these third-party developers. And... It's going to be interesting because it means that we could be getting a lot of unique content from these third party publishers and maybe they'll release on PlayStation. But I think a lot of these games like Henna are going to release on PC as well. So I don't think this means that you're going to have to buy a PS5 to play all of these 25 games. I think they're just going to be released console exclusively to PlayStation and then like Henna are going to be released on PC. And at the same time, Lots of creativity comes out of indie style developers and these third party developers that are new with creative talent. So it is an exciting thing. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of this. But I think what they are seeing here is that they got to fill in those gaps. They got to put content out. And which is one of the reasons why I think that the Xbox strategy of what they have been doing with Game Pass is and backwards compatibility is the best strategy that is going on right now and why I think I've made a video. I think it was like Xbox strategy wins or something. And I talked about it because not only does their strategy allow them to avoid what's going on with the chip shortages with pushing consoles into people's homes and then locking them into that console to play your games, they can avoid, they're avoiding a lot of that with having game pass available on PC and on mobile phones. So they're still going to be making money through people who are, signing up to Game Pass through those other platforms, making purchases through the Xbox store on PC and all that kind of stuff. Whereas with PlayStation, those chip shortages are really hindering the amount of PS5s that are getting out to the public, which directly is hindering their bottom line. And there's no real real way around that for them because they've locked in to their ecosystem with their strategy through the console. And then we look at, what PlayStation has done with the PS5, although they've sold more PlayStations than PS4s, 
if you have a PS5, you're, a lot of people are sitting there with nothing to play. So users are not going in every single day to the PlayStation store to buy games and purchase stuff and do all that kind of stuff because there just really isn't anything there besides what has come out with Miles Morales, Demon Souls, Returnal, and then you got Ratchet and Clank coming out in June. So it's four big games, but those big games have a lifespan of, let's say, on average, 30 hours on average, if I'm giving it at the high end, and then a lot of people will put those away and not play them again. Then you look what Xbox is doing with backwards compatibility, how they've enhanced backwards compatibility, and they've made backwards compatibility one of the best selling features of the Xbox Series X and S. And then you have Game Pass. So even if there are big gaps in those first party releases from Xbox, we're waiting in a whole other year for Halo Infinite. Through this entire year, I don't think there's anybody out there who is a who loves video games and like plays a lot of games, I guess I'm kind of just, maybe I'm assuming here, but I'm thinking of people kind of like, who are kind of like me, who just like to play games play and try stuff out. I have not at one point sat back on my Xbox and said, I have nothing to play. Even though there hasn't been a first party release, I have not one point sat back and said that. Like I said, with my PS5, it's collecting dust. But the, with the Xbox Series X and S, I go onto Game Pass, I find something to play every time I boot it up and there, I have such a huge backlog of backwards compatibility and now a lot of these games have HDR auto HDR and FPS boost so jumping into these backwards compatible games is just so much more enjoyable and like makes me want to try them out even more than I did before so those empty areas of gaming with Xbox those gaps are always filled with something to play and then then you all of a sudden have the big first party exclusives that are going to start dropping. So I think that strategy is an awesome strategy for gamers. And I think it's a winning strategy going forward. And I think PlayStation is really kind of seeing that kind of stuff. And that's why they, they put out this article. They say there's games coming, there's games coming 25 games for PlayStation five under PlayStation studios brand, but obviously they can't make them all in house with their first party studio. So they're going to go out and they're going to find these third parties that want to create games exclusively for PlayStation or, you know, make a deal with them, give them lots of money to do it so that they can fill in these gaps between, let's say, Ratchet and Clank and then whenever the next first party game comes out or Gran Turismo 7 and then whenever the next, I don't know, Uncharted or whatever comes out. So there's going to be, at the end of the day, you look at the different strategies, I find it interesting, but there's going to be tons of games for everyone to play no matter what platform. I just think there's always going to be more to play on the xbox ecosystem because of their strategy which is ironic because you still have people out there saying that xbox has no games and just continuing on with this topic i came across this article as well and it says that ps5 game sales and engagement are higher than ps4s and demand supply balance to improve in the latter half of the year but the main thing here that the engagement is higher with ps5 or ps4 and i find this article interesting but also misleading at the same time because like I previously said, I think that Xbox has done a great job with filling in the gaps between launches of big games, which will continuously bring people back to the platform to in, be engaged with the platform to purchase stuff. And I think overall, they're just going to make more money with that strategy. And in this article, it says here, which you could use and it potentially contradict what I'm thinking about this, but I just wanted to go over because I want to just let me know if you think I'm interpreting this right or not. But they say here, user engagement was also much higher with 81% greater time spent by PlayStation users logged into the PS5 compared to the launch time frame of the PS4. So the launch time frame of the PS5, 2020, 2021 versus the launch time frame of the PS4 between late 2013 and early 2014. Now, there's a few reasons why this would make a lot of sense. One, there were, I mean, there's so many PS4s that were sold. P PlayStation is uh, like the pinnacle right now of like its popularity, I would say, in terms of a gaming platform. So when the PS5 was announced, you know, they sold 7.8 million units. They beat the PS4 sales and units. So yeah, there's going to be more people who log into a PS5 than a PS4 just off of their sales alone. But on top of that, we're in a pandemic. So I mean, like there's really nothing else to do, especially when there's lockdowns going on. Then to, if you're a gamer, log into your PlayStation 
just browse around or play a game or whatever it is. But I find this this a little bit misleading because my point that I was making was with Xbox, there's never really a gap of games because of Game Pass and the back, great backwards compatibility that they're doing. With PlayStation, there's been a large gap since the release of Spider-Man and Miles Morales. And PlayStation just released their financial reports like two weeks ago or something. And one of the things I talked about, and this was on, I think, two podcasts ago, was was how this stat here kind of proves that even though PlayStation had two first party launch games, Miles Morales and Demon Souls, besides those two games, there's been nothing really to play on PlayStation. And it says here, swapping to user engagement to Sony's PlayStation Plus service rose 15% to 47.6 million. Monthly active users across all PlayStation network dipped a bit now at 109 million compared to 114 million a year prior still the rise in playstation plus paid memberships is more significant contributor to the gaming saving pushing network services sales up 14 percent year over year but the big thing here is the monthly active users across all playstation network dipped a bit now at 109 million compared to 114 million a year prior and you would think that if there was always something to play on playstation this wouldn't be a stat you wouldn't have a dip in monthly active users whether there's a pandemic or whether it's not a pandemic or all that kind of stuff because there will always be something people want to log in to their playstation to play but what this i think is showing that the majority like not the majority but like a lot of people buy a playstation console only to play those first party exclusives and that's all they play on them so when there isn't anything to play significantly for many months so i guess it released in november december january february march april when did return will come out april so five months when there isn't anything to play people aren't logging into their playstations if there isn't that first party game coming out people aren't logging into their playstations which why this is why sony needs to invest in these third-party publishers to launch games exclusively on PlayStation to fill in those gaps so that that monthly user engagement doesn't dip. Because when people are logging into PlayStation, they're purchasing stuff. They're playing games. They're making purchases on the PlayStation network. And Sony makes tons of money through people buying stuff on the PlayStation network and DLC and all that kind of stuff. So they need to reduce the amount of use. They don't want to see a dip in monthly users they want to see an increase in monthly users every single month which is why they have to fill in those gaps and which is why i think with xbox it's the better strategy because with game pass you don't really need to worry about that if there's nothing if there's no new game that's come out if you're subscribed to xbox game pass it's like netflix if you go on to netflix not really know knowing what is there a lot of the time at least i do i just go in there i'm like oh what am i gonna watch today i'll just go into netflix and pick something out with Xbox Game Pass, no matter what time of the month it is, no matter what day it is, no matter what games are releasing, I think a lot of people just go on to Game Pass and say, hmm, what am I going to play today? There's something to play because Game Pass has so many games. So it's it's an interesting, like I said, to compare these strategies. And this is why this article here, although it sounds like it's great, I mean, it is good to have more people, more users logging into PS5 in the launch period compared to the PS4 launch period, but I think it's a bit misleading as to what that actually means. All right, and moving on here to the last two topics of the show, and they're both going to be some Xbox topics. The first one here being that Microsoft is rolling out Dolby Vision to test on the Xbox Series X and S. So Dolby Vision is something that I think a lot of people have been waiting for and a lot of people have been wanting, and right now it is in the Xbox Insider's Alpha Ring. And what it means is that there's going to be brighter highlights sharper contrast and more vibrant colors and Dolby Vision offers better clarity in both light and dark scenes. It's just basically an upgraded, I guess, HDR. It gives better HDR than the current HDR right now available on the Xbox Series X and S because right now there is HDR available on the consoles in HDR 10 and then Dolby Vision will be like that next step upwards if you if your display supports it. Now what's interesting about Dolby Vision is that 
it's automatically going to map to any display with it enabled or with Dolby Vision on it. So you're going to always be able to see the best possible picture available. And this is something I think Xbox does very well with backwards compatibility, with just making sure that your display is displaying, I mean, the best picture it can have. So whenever you get into a backwards compatible game, you see the auto HDR, you see the FPS booth instantly enabled on games like that. And you also see like HDR on your TV display. So you don't really have to worry about going in, fiddling with the features and everything to make sure that you're getting the best picture. And it looks like it's gonna be the same thing here with Dolby Vision. However, if you are in the alpha ring, they do advise that testers may need to update their TV's firmware to take full advantage of the technology. Now, it's a feature I think a lot of people want. I mean, I don't know that much about Dolby Vision and how much of a difference it makes. I'm gonna definitely check out to make sure that if I'm in the alpha ring, I do have access to it because I do have Dolby Vision on my TV, I believe. But what is the big thing here is that this is something as well that the PlayStation 5 does not support. And to me, this is just another great quality of life feature that is available on the Xbox Series X and S that is not currently available on the PlayStation 5. And just as an aside to this, since we're talking about Dolby, Dolby Atmos, I use it with my Xbox wireless headset. I used the free trial, like as soon as I used it, I went ahead and I bought it because it's like a one-time fee for 18 or 17 bucks or something. And man, is it worth it. If you have the Xbox wireless headset, I would definitely recommend checking out Dolby Atmos for the sound because it makes a big difference when you're just using like Windows Sonic. I absolutely love Dolby Atmos and I'm gonna keep using the headset with that going forward. And I'm sure once Dolby Vision gets onto my Xbox, I'll be continuously using that as well. So if you're interested in that, you're in the insider alpha ring, make sure to check out Dolby Vision. And if you have used Dolby Vision before, like you have experience, a lot of experience with it or whatever, and you know the difference between just the regular HDR and then Dolby Vision, let me know in the comments below because I would love to hear your feedback on that. And then finally, we're gonna end off here with a partnership that I don't think a lot of people are talking about. And it is Xbox teaming up with Tencent's honor of Kingsmaker, Timmy Studio. So this is a brand new Xbox partnership that hasn't gotten too much press, hasn't gotten too much media. I don't see very many people talking about it on social media and everything. Maybe I've missed it, but I just don't think I've seen it. And it is a partnership between Timmy Studio Group, which is a mobile game developer, and they have created games like Honor of Kings and Call of Duty Mobile, and they've made $2.5 billion in player spending, and they pocketed $10 billion in revenue last year. So it's it's a big um, mobile studio. And with mobile games, if you have a hit mobile games, you're going to make a lot of money because everybody has a phone. Everybody has access to the games, which I think kind of goes directly in line with xbox's strategy this generation with xcloud and having it available through streaming on your phone in the asian market specifically where they love playing games on their phones and they're going to be able to have access to xcloud and game pass games right through their mobile device through streaming and i think a lot of these things are stuff that they looked at before they went ahead and made that decision with how big mobile gaming is now, what this partnership means, nobody really knows because they don't say what this, what if they're going to be making games specifically for mobile, if they're going to be making games specifically for console. But what it does do is it ties in with the release of the Xbox Series X and S in China. And I think it's going to, it's being used as a marketing avenue to let people know that, hey, there's going to be games coming from studios that you know that will be available through Xbox in one way or another or available as an xbox product i guess you could say in one way or another whether that is going to be through xbox game pass through the store the xbox store or just a mobile game that has xbox game studios published now will this make its way over to north america or to europe who knows but i think that's why they went ahead with this partnership more than anything is that they're trying to coincide it with the release of the xbox in china so that there is a name of a studio that people in China know and then they can correlate that with Xbox and they'll be like, hey, maybe I should pick up this new Xbox because there could be games coming from Timmy Studios on to this console and I want to play those games. So I think that's why they're doing it. 
but maybe they're thinking about getting even further into the mobile market and creating just strictly mobile games that will either be available on Android and, and iPhone and as well as available on Game Pass. And you're going to be able to just get access to that if you have a Game Pass subscription. You wouldn't even have to really stream those games because they would be mobile games. Or maybe Timmy wants to get into the console sphere and they're going to be making console games or porting over mobile games to the console and then selling those games with the Xboxes in China. There's so many things that could be coming out of this, but I think it's a pretty relatively big partnership, even though it may not affect us here in if you're listening i shouldn't say us but like if you're listening from north america or europe it may not affect us that much we not see too many things from it but i think it's a pretty big thing for xbox who has constantly said they're trying to break in further into the asian markets like japan like china and other asian markets and stuff like that so i'm gonna leave that there and i'm gonna wrap up the plume cast episode number seven with that and i just before i sign off here thank you guys again for listening you've listened throughout this entire episode let me know what you think about it let me know what you think about any of these topics and hit that like button if you enjoyed it hit that subscribe button if you're new here and you like this and you want to hear more also check out my channel um i make weekly news videos or daily news videos actually uh, mondays through saturdays unless there's absolutely nothing to make so i want to thank you guys again just appreciate all the support i have been getting i've reached over 4,000 subscribers now i would never in a million years thought i would have done that particularly because I started my YouTube channel like 2017 and I was around like 200, 300 subscribers for the majority of that time. And then all of a sudden now I'm at 4,000. So it really does mean a lot to me that you guys enjoy my content. I really appreciate it. And I will catch you guys throughout the week with my daily videos or next week on the Plumecast.